Seems better. Yep. Okay, great. Well, welcome back to our terrific day talking about appointments. We're here to continue our session talking about the politics of appointments. We have Jillian Metzger from Columbia who's now going to kick us off for the second half of this session. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's excellent, right? <laughs> awesome. So I'm going to begin, um, as has everybody, but with very heartfelt thanks. Um, this has been a great day so far. I've really enjoyed the morning, um, uh, and I hope the afternoon will be as good. Um, I have been awed by the degree of organization that the Duke Law Journal has brought to this event. Um, it is rare that every logistical question I could possibly think of, and then some that really just didn't even occur to me, um, have been answered before I, I even thought of them. So um, I, I am really impressed, and many thanks. Um, so as the very fact that we are having this uh, symposium on it today, the federal appointments process um, has, is having its star turn. Um, and the, the aspects of it that I, my paper focuses on is the uh, appearance of the appointments process in the separation of powers decisions by the Roberts Court, um, and then also um, on how that contrasts and relates to the way the appointments process um, uh, is becoming a site of increasing national political engagement between Congress and the White House. Um, the fact that we see the appointments uh, process having this kind of prominence um, uh, simultaneously in the judicial and political realm is not um, uh, coincidental. Right? You, if you think of a case like Noel Canning, um, it was President Obama's use of the recess appointments power that then triggers um, the Supreme Court decision. Um, so there's a clear causal uh, linkage in, in some ways um, between these two. But the point of my essay is to emphasize there's also a very notable contrast in how the appointments process is treated in the judicial um, and political spheres. Um, and uh, if you focus on the judicial sphere, um, the dominant characteristic that I see is a real resistance to innovation. Um, and by contrast, what I think is sort of the signal characteristic of what we're seeing in the appointments process in the political sphere um, uh, is indeed innovation, new approaches, um, not just limited to the appointments process, um, but uh, happening um, across sites of national political engagement. Um, and so uh, the paper's aim is to chart the contrast between the judicial and political spheres, um, and then also identify what I think some of the implications are um, from those differences um, uh, on uh, uh, structural innovation. And I think the bottom line is I find the divergence troubling. Um, I think, among other things, it means that we are likely to have um, continuing contestation between the judicial and political branches. Um, and uh, with the corollary of the court um, continuing to be involved in fairly high stakes political disputes, um, which I find uh, uh, somewhat troubling. Um, uh, in addition, I think this is problematic because if you think about possible reforms, and I have to admit to being a bit pessimistic about what reforms might actually work, um, but to the extent there are political reforms um, or institutional reforms that we can imagine that would improve the appointments process in the political sphere, they tend to be innovative. Um, they tend to be deviations from our, uh, the, the practices that have existed to now. Um, and so the judicial resistance to innovation, I think, um, may pose an obstacle towards reforms that might actually help in limiting um, some political dysfunctionality um, and polarization. Um, OK, so that's the, those, that's the bottom line. Now let me give a little bit more detail. So first, on the judicial side, and we're going to hear more um, uh, about these two decisions um, from Ron, uh, Free Enterprise Fund and Noel Canning, um, both of which involve uh, removals, appointments, um, the, the personnel aspects. Um, I expect the decisions are, are well known to all of you, um, but just to give a very uh, brief syn uh, synopsis, so Free Enterprise involved the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, uh, which was created by Sarbanes-Oxley to regulate accounting of public companies. Um, it was a board that was subject to very extensive SEC oversight. Um, uh, but the members who were appointed to the PCAOB um, had substantial removal protection. Um, and uh, on top of this, the court um, uh, 
uh, concluded, um, it's not actually clear in the statute, that the SEC had substantial removal protection, and the court assumed that for purposes of deciding the case, um, and then concluded that the combination of two levels of four-cause uh, removal protection, double four-cause, um, uh, violated Article II's uh, vesting and take care clauses and was unconstitutional. Um, and then you have the Noel Canning decision invoked already um, from last term involving uh, President Obama's use of the recess appointments power during a pro forma session of the Senate. Um, uh, there, uh, again, many interesting features of the decision, including what one might think of as a fair bit of dicta, um, in that the court first ruled that the recess appointments clause extends to um, intrust session uh, vacant uh, recesses um, and to vacancies that exist before um, the recesses come into effect, only to conclude that the actual use of the recess appointments power that was before it um, uh, was unconstitutional um, because of four pro, uh, pro forma session counts as um, a session and not as a recess, and therefore the recess appointments um, power had not been triggered. Um, uh, both of these decisions, this is where I think um, I, I was particularly interested in, in, in reading Ron's piece because there's, I think there's, I think we come down in a similar way on the, on the views of these cases. Um, uh, they, they seem in their analytic style at first quite different. I think actually they're more similar than appearances at first might suggest. Um, they both have formalistic and functionalist um, analytic moves. Um, uh, free Enterprise Fund uh, for sure is more dominantly formalistic. Noel Canning is a little bit more dominantly functionalistic with its emphasis on practice and underlying purpose. Um, but at the same time, you have uh, kind of a functionalist concern with political accountability in free enterprise and a very formalistic analysis um, of uh, pro forma sessions, power of the Senate um, to determine when it is in session um, and thereby establish the scope of the recess appoint appointments power in Noel Canning. Um, so I don't think the analytic um, differences on that front are so great. Um, I think there are some even more important notable um, similarities between them, one of which is that neither decision strikes me as being particularly interested in engaging with current governmental realities um, at all. So if you focus on free uh, enterprise fund, um, the court really zeroes in on removal and ignores the realities of the relationships between the SEC and the PCAOB, um, the extent to which actually the PCAOB would call um, the SEC before they were taking an enforcement action to find out what the SEC would do, um, the SEC's control of their budget and so forth. There was a tremendous amount of um, uh, actual political oversight by the SEC that that opinion ignores. Um, and similarly, Noel Canning, I mean, one of the striking things about Noel Canning is it really gets into the historical practice over time. Um, and then that, dis that goes away. We're no longer interested in when we get to the current period. Um, uh, and the sort of realities behind the use of the recess appointments power in the middle of a pro forma session um, are not engaged with by the court um, at all. Um, I, uh, so that's one similarity, this lack of engagement with current realities. Um, more importantly, for my purposes here, is what I see in both, which is a real a marked suspicion of innovative structural and institutional arrangements. Um, you get this expressly in Free Enterprise Fund, where the court um, emphasizes the no novelty of double for cause, saying that the most telling indication of a severe constitutional problem is, is the lack of historical precedent. Um, in Noel Canning, uh, the court doesn't emphasize the lack of precedent for the use of the recess appointments power, um, but what it does emphasize repeatedly is the importance of long-standing historical precedent and practice, um, uh, long-standing historical precedent and practice, which kind of by definition isn't around when you're doing something more innovative. Um, uh, and uh, it was the novel actions that get invalidated. Um, so you see um, uh, what I think is a, is a decided judicial skepticism on the Roberts Court of Innovation um, in these cases. And it, it, it's, if you open the lens a little bit and you look at the Roberts Court more broadly, um, you do see it in other uh, decisions as well. The most prominent one is Sebelius, and FIB versus Sebelius, the, affordable, uh, the, the first Affordable Care Act case, um, uh, where um, the court again, and they go back to free enterprise fund and they invoke this idea, lack of historical precedent, that's a reason for constitutional uh, suspicion. Um, 
If you go beyond that, um, I think it's not so clear that the court is resistant to innovation. Um, in this regard in particular, the court itself is very willing to take, the Roberts Court, to take some fairly innovative stances. So when you think about, um, and this has been a change over the course of the Roberts Court, which began much more incrementalist, much more Burkean in its style, and then uh, switched to more radical stances. So if you contrast a case like Wisconsin Right to Life, an as-applied invalidation of McCain-Feingold, and then you get Citizens United, right, um, and a much broader sweeping um, constitutional invalidation. Um, similarly, if you take the Namundo case on the Voting Rights Act, right, you know, reading a statutory provision broadly to avoid the constitutional problems, and then you get Shelby County, um, where the court um, essentially eviscerated the Voting Rights Act preclearance regime. Um, so I think it's, I think the question of exactly how um, resistant to innovation, uh, at least in its, of its own actions, that the, the Roberts Court um, is, 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 is a complex question. Um, but if you focus on a case like Shelby County, um, one of the striking things about the analysis of Shelby County is the lengths to which the Roberts Court goes to portray the Voting Rights Act preclearance regime as itself an innovation. That, it, that the court was then now um, just reinstituting, reinstituting the appropriate constitutional order of equal sovereignty um, among the states. So I think this resistance to innovation is still clear even in those cases, and you certainly do see it um, coming up uh, in the structural separation of, of powers cases, um, uh, Free Enterprise Fund and Noel Canning, um, and a little bit in, in that aspect of Shelby. So that's the, that's the judicial sphere. Um, so how about appointments in the political sphere? And we've already heard um, uh, a lot about that today. Um, not particularly surprisingly, the dominant response, uh, the political branches, is to treat appointments, um, both executive branch and judicial, um, as one among several areas of political contestation. Um, and uh, that, that we've had some discussion from Russ in terms of uh, that not being a new phenomenon. Um, uh, and insofar as it is the political branches, perhaps we would find it um, not particularly surprising that this would be occasion for, for uh, political contestation in terms of appointments. Um, the, the factor that makes, that, that really contributes here and highlights um, the contestation in new ways is, is one that Bill mentioned, which, um, and others, which is polarization, right? The extent to which um, we have um, uh, dramatically increased political polarization. Um, uh, with cross issues, with lack of over overlap and, and uh, lineup of the positions of the parties. Um, uh, and the combination of uh, seeing appointments as a site of political contestation and growing um, political uh, polarization leads to a couple of effects, which we've already, one of which we've already talked about today, and Anne's work really highlights, which is delay, the extent to which we're seeing increasing delay uh, in appointments. Um, and then Nina nicely uh, analyzed sort of what the impact of that might be on administrative agencies and whether we should be concerned uh, uh, about that. Um, but delay then being one aspect, uh, delay in appointments that we see. Um, the aspect that I'm more interested in is that I think the effect of the political contestation about appointments and polarization is that we're also seeing a lot of innovation in the appointments process. Um, uh, with uh, new um, uses of, of measures like holds, um, more expansive uses of holds perhaps for independent policy reasons, um, the background to Noel Canning, right, pro forma sessions to prevent recess appointments, um, recess appointments notwithstanding uh, pro forma sessions, the uh, filibuster reform um, that was talked about, um, uh, all of these being sort of new innovations um, that um, I think are coming into existence to deal with the political contestation and disagreement on, um, uh, on appointments. Um, and it's not just appointments. Um, I'm, a number of congressional scholars have documented erosion in a number of sort of longstanding institutional norms and conventions. Um, there have been very high profile instances with the debt ceiling crisis and the government shutdown recently. Um, but there are also things that um, Barbara Sinclair in particular has talked about in terms of unorthodox lawmaking, use of reconciliation, new modes of functioning um, in, the, um, in, in Congress, um, uh, and also in the executive branch. I mean, so you also see um, uh, new forms of executive action to deal with um, seeming resistance and obstruction 
um, in Congress. Um, uh, and um, you know, measures, not just the, the kind of non public non-enforcement measures and actions that we saw with the recent immigration actions, but measures like waivers, you know, much more dramatic use of waivers, of grants of statutory authority to waive in ways that fundamentally reshape um, a, an existing legislative uh, regime um, uh, because of the failure uh, and inability to get legislative change in Congress. Um, in addition to polarization, a major contributing factor is divided government, right? So um, uh, in many ways, uh, the way that you're able to sort of affect, uh, one of the parties is able to affect policy in Congress is more to be obstructionist um, than necessarily to go along, um, unless you control the executive branch, in which case um, uh, you might turn, that, that party turns more towards executive action. Um, the point that I think is, is worth noting, though, is that you can't, it, there's also tremendous innovation potential in periods of united government, because when you finally get all the three branches together, um, uh, there is uh, an incentive to really um, enact measures, and the polarization also means there may be more agreement um, on more radical uh, legislative and policy proposals, but in addition, lack of a need to compromise, even within the party, as the parties themselves pull apart um, uh, and become more consistent on policy. So whether it's divided government or whether it's unified government, I think a case can be made that we're going to be seeing innovative measures um, continuing to occur, and not just in the appointments process. Um, and not just innovation, but you see this kind of punch counterpunch quality, right? Um, each branch is, is responding to, to moves and actions by the other. Um, the reason why I, I, I focus on that aspect of uh, the political treatment of appointments is, is because of the tremendous contrast I see between that and the judicial approach, right? Um, so we see, I think, really two trends that are on uh, somewhat of a collision course. Um, with increasing skepticism and resistance to innovation in the judicial sphere, um, and an increasing turn to innovation and new institutional arrangements in the political sphere. Um, so then the question is whether or not we should see um, that contrast um, and conflict um, over innovation to be a good thing um, or a source of, of concern. Um, uh, and although I think it's I come down on the it's a source of concern side. Um, there is a positive view that I think should be articulated um, for it. And the positive view is basically this judicial political opposition um, on innovation means that the courts are doing their job. Um, they are preventing any one branch from perverting the constitutional structure for um, immediate partisan gain, right? Um, this is what judicial separation of powers um, enforcement should look like. Um, uh, and uh, innovation and novelty are good grounds to think that um, a movement away from the underlying constitutional structure is afoot. Um, uh, there, that, that view is not without some appeal, um, but I think it's really too sanguine. Um, so uh, one thing just to note at the outset is that um, the very extent of judicial political conflict here um, it means that I think we're going to be continuing uh, into a period um, where you have a lot of judicial invalidation of either legislative or executive branch initiatives. Um, uh, I think that uh, just from some from concerns about how the court is functioning and its perceptions in society, I think that will um, uh, increase uh, perceptions of the court as political, particularly when we get the kinds of ideological, strict ideological breakdowns on the court that we're seeing. Um, uh, and one could question whether that, what that is going to do, whether it's going to have some effect on the um, usually quite strong views of the court's legitimacy. Um, uh, but certainly as, um, as a legal scholar, I find that aspect of what we're likely to see troubling. Um, I also think that the thing to, to, to not lose sight of is that the judicial interventions are really asymmetric. Um, and um, first of all, most political branch innovations escape judicial scrutiny. Um, uh, because of the requirements for getting uh, cases into court, um, uh, you're going to see much more, uh, much more likely that you're going to see judicial review of actions um, taken by the branches than you are of inaction. Um, we're seeing this actually now with the, um, the effort by Texas and I think it's 18 other states to challenge the immigration uh, reform actions. Um, uh, Sheriff Apayo. In, uh, in Phoenix, um, sought to challenge that in the DC Circuit and was 
had the case kicked out on standing grounds. Um, Texas and some other states are trying to build a case much more in the lines of uh, Massachusetts versus EPA with some idea of state standing given how those actions play into state law. Um, it's unclear whether or not the courts will conclude that has standing. Um, but that's a kind of non-enforcement action um, that to the extent it is judicially reviewable will be reviewable because it has certain positive action aspects, the grant of work authorization, that then impacts other schemes. Um, Non-enforcement uh, non that's much more of an inaction variety is much more likely to get judicial review. So you're going to get the courts intervening much more against action than against inaction. Um, uh, and um, particularly if you're talking about, if you don't draw a distinction between instances where the innovation takes the form of legislation, um, as it did, for example, if you go back to the Sebelius case, um, not involving appointments but involving legislation, the Affordable Care Act, if you're going to be suspicious of innovation in legislation, um, that's going to then become an impediment um, to congressional action, those rare instances where we actually see um, uh, major measures um, getting enacted these days. So that should also be, I think, source of concern. Um, uh, even when you're just talking about executive action, um, I, given the realities of, de, of polarization and divides between the branches, it may well be that the main area in which we can see effective governance is going to be within the executive branch. Um, uh, and um, even if novel, assuming agencies aren't exceeding the scope of their authority, um, it may be troubling uh, that the court is then intervening to make action to implement existing um, existing statutory regimes and to ensure um, movement forward among agencies um, uh, to be suspect because of more, being more innovative. Um, uh, and there are similarly, you know, in, insofar as the court is intervening to strike those actions down, that it's also intervening to preclude the kind of punch, counterpunch, um, which may be how the branches are going to be interacting for a while, right? So agency action um, taken uh, may, to the extent that has a prodding effect on Congress um, to try and countermand it. Um, unclear if it will, but to the extent that would be there, um, judicial action to strike it down precludes um, pressure on Congress then to act. Um, so those are some of the reasons, I think, to be concerned about, um, about the disconnect and the judicial suspicion of innovation that we're seeing. Um, yet another uh, final reason is that if you think about, um, and again, here I'm somewhat pessimistic, um, but if there are going to be institutional reforms um, and other measures that seem likely to address, um, or to some extent, um, or, or uh, even just on the margin, some of the polarization and its harmful effects um, uh, in congressional functioning and in the relation between the branches, those are likely to be innovative measures, right? So uh, potentially reforms um, that might open up the primary system, um, regimes like uh, the base closing regime um, where you try to take create institutional arrangements that can actually address certain issues outside of the political sphere. We've had those before, but it may be that we need to be using them on a broader scale. Um, these would all be um, more innovative me measures. Um, and again, if we're going to be, if the courts are going to be suspicious of innovation, then I think that they risk becoming a significant impediment to the political branches working out solutions to growing polarization um, uh, that might allow government to continue to function better. Um, that uh, leads to the final reason why I think judicial uh, skepticism of innovation um, is problematic, and that's because I don't think it has a very strong con constitutional basis. Um, and here I have to say I, I think I disagree somewhat with Russ. Um, I think actually our separation of power system um, was meant to be fluid um, and not fixed in, in what it requires. Um, I think there is both uh, skepticism and a desire for deliberation and some resistance. Uh, to action um, in the form uh, of legislation, but there is also a uh, real commitment to um, effective governance. Um, uh, and uh, neither one of those can really insist on dominance. Um, and what we're seeing with the resistance to innovation and with the obstructionism um, is an emphasis on, in, on that kind of resistance to uh, governmental action at the expense of the effective government part. Um, uh, if you want a constitutional basis for it, it's the Necessary and Proper Clause, right, which grants power to Congress to determine what are appropriate means. Um, 
uh, and innovative means may very well be uh, appropriate means. Um, uh, so when Congress is undertaking innovative actions, um, uh, I don't think we can just po point to the background um, concerns with uh, resisting action in our separation of power system uh, and think that that's enough to make them legitimate. Um, the executive branch doesn't have uh, a necessary and proper clause, but it has other provisions. And obviously, um, ensuring effective governance was part um, of the thinking and creating uh, a unitary um, uh, a uh, single-headed executive branch. Um, uh, and of course, the executive branch, insofar as is wielding delegated authority, um, is also, in that sense, conf conforming to the constitutional system. Um, I think I'm pretty clearly revealing that I am much more of a functionalist when it comes to separation of powers. Um, but I think that this view that innovation is actually legitimate is not limited just to functionalists. Um, John Manning, who is much more of a textualist, um, and in some sense more of a formalist than I am, uh, in his recent Harvard Law Review forum, similarly emphasized the necessary and proper clauses giving a lot of power to set these relationships to Congress. Um, uh, and so the idea of the courts coming in and pushing back um, at arrangement that, that have um, uh, legislative sanction in some form um, uh, seems to be dubious um, on constitutional grounds. Um, so where does that leave us, and what should, how should the court uh, approach issues of innovation? And one of the things um, that I think the court needs to do is to um, become much more contextually sensitive, um, to look at how the novel um, or innovative mechanisms that are at issue are working in practice, the d dynamics that they're responding to, um, uh, and more generally to be much more aware about the practical effects of their decisions, um, and to make sure that um, their decisions don't become um, part of the political part of the political game. Um, one of the things that's striking about some of these decisions is the extent to which the court is is playing very fast and loose with the remedial aspects of its decisions, um, either just you know invalidating a particular part um, uh, or not being willing um, to limit the impact and you know, sort of taking a very narrow view about the de facto officer. Um, uh, doctrine and other ways in which it could kind of limit the fallout um, of judicial invalidation if the court were to conclude it was necessary. Um, and just more general engagement with the realities that are leading to the kinds of arrangements that we're seeing, I think would, would both inform uh, the judicial assessment of their constitutionality, um, but would also prove to be very important um, uh, in providing guidance to the political branches about what kinds of measures might be constitutional and what kinds of measures might not be. Um, and the, the, if there's a takeaway here that sort of relates to the panels earlier in the day, um, as I said to Dave and um, uh, uh, Nina afterwards, um, you know, the, the role of judicial review um, of agency actions and how the courts are responding um, to what they're seeing in the agencies and in the political sphere is an important dynamic of whether or not agencies are going to be able to function. Um, so not just the constitutional review, but also the more nuts and bolts administrative law review um, and the role that the courts play um, in either being very resistant uh, to more innovative actions or, or more accommodating um, is going to make, I think, a very big difference um, in the extent to which polarization um, uh, that we're seeing in the appointments process is, has as se severe an effect um, as it might occur currently be seeming to have. Thanks very much. Professor Metzger. Uh, at this point, we're going to welcome our own uh, Professor Stuart Benjamin down to the podium um, to comment on her piece. Uh, Professor Benjamin. Thank you. And, oh, good. And I, have a, I, have a, I only have a couple of slides, and they're, and they're ready. Um, so, um, so I think it's obviously a tremendously important um, set of issues to talk about. And I want to pick up on um, Jillian's point about innovation. So the easy, oh, I need to start my stopwatch. And so the easy response to make to an argument about innovation is, um, well, that's not what we do. We always have to look to text. That's what the dissent in Noel Canning wanted to do. Um, no, I don't want to. It's OK. Oh, wait, I, oh, should, I, should I do that as I'm talking? Let's do it. All right. I mean, I don't even the second, but um, you, uh, uh, projector um, on. Um, so. Um, we have text, 
and we have um, um, and we have uh, history, but we don't have a jurisprudence that focuses on innovation. It's not courts are, courts are not in the habit of of saying, "Oh, look, the the world has changed. It's been made anew. This is this is year one. Uh, we're gonna have." Uh, 10-day weeks, that was the French Revolution, and, and new names for the months, you know, that's, that's not what we're accustomed to, um, to courts doing. Um, and it seems to me that's a totally fair uh, response, but I want to suggest that there's, there is an historical period where there was a different reaction. So it's the Great Depression. So in, the, in response to the Great Depression, there was a very widespread sense, both that our economic thinking had to change and our governmental and judicial thinking um, had to change. So I've just got a couple of, of choice quotes. I could, I could pick them almost, you could almost open up any page of James Landis and find quotations, quotations like this. But here are two nice ones. So the top one, uh, uh, you, you see, it, uh, as the demands for positive solutions increased, um, laissez-faire came to an end. Right, so his take on the significance of the history just before he wrote this book was we had an economic system, it ground to a halt. We had to have a new way of, of looking at things. And then you see this, uh, this second quotation, and by the way, this whole notion of like the separation of powers, we're over that. Um, um, we don't need these three... Um, we don't need these three separate things. We instead want to have a government that is responsive to the world as it, as it exists today. Quite self-consciously saying, because of the Great Depression, we need to think about the economy differently. We need to think about governance differently. We need to think about um, how, presumably, how courts will respond differently. Just to be clear, he had a very, very straightforward view on how courts should respond. They should play no role whatsoever. Courts should do nothing whatever to stop all this experimentation. He was quite, uh, he was quite clear about that. Um, just one other quotation, you might say, yeah, well, who was James Landis, right? He was merely an architect of the New Deal who created the SEC, et cetera. OK, fine. Um, so then there's this other slightly more obscure figure. Um, uh, and again, this is, I mean, I can, he, he'd said lots of things like this, too. This is sort of also, um, this is sort of uh, uh, also him talking, and, and part of the reason I wanted that highlight this is, again, he's saying, we had a scheme. It just doesn't work anymore. We need to see things completely differently. Um, so that's it. I, I, I had other slides that I realized. I, I don't need to belabor this point. I think you all, all know this was the kind of things that were said in the, uh, in the Great Depression. So I will spare you the other, the other slides. Actually, I've taken them off this, this uh, anyway. The, the point that I'm getting at here is um, sort of the dog that didn't bark, either in the aftermath of the Great Recession, or in the aftermath of what's happening politically now. I'm not claiming the two are related. I'm simply noting you could imagine, in response to, let's just start with the Great Recession. You could imagine in response to the Great Recession, people saying, wow, we had a certain kind of system and a certain way of understanding things and a certain way of understanding governance, and it's just got to change because we had a, we had a government failure in part and, it, and this was terrible, and we need to radically uh, rethink things. There were some said, I don't think I, I, that, I think, that, I think I'm, I'm willing to say that position did not win the day. That the kinds of statements, I know I'm pointing now, there's no screen there, but the kind of statements that were on the screen from Landis and Frankfurter would now be regarded as wacky. I actually first thought about, like, should I just put up the statements and say, can you guess who said them, you know? Um, but the answer would be, it would be nobody with anything like the gravitas of Landis and Frankfurter today who were making those same kinds of uh, statements, and, and more importantly, and having to be acted on. I mean, the whole point is Landis and Frankfurter won. Um, so in response to the Great Recession, that's a dog that didn't bark. And it's also a dog that basically hasn't barked in response to um, the significant changes that we've talked about in the way confirmations um, have proceeded um, over the last few years. Um, uh, Chris Schrader, my, my, when, he was, when he was my boss at OLC many years ago, noted how easy it would be for one senator to gum up the works, preventing the Senate from operating with unanimous consent in regular order in a variety of ways, and how it doesn't happen. Well, now it does. 
Um, and now we've got, uh, we have truly new things that are happening, and yet I have not seen that translate into, um, uh, you know, in particular, James point, judges saying, okay, now we're in this different world, we need to, we need, we need to reconsider things. And by the way, just to tie up the point about, about Frankfurter, of course, the response for courts in the Great Depression wasn't immediate. We, we know, in fact, the four horsemen hung on for a while, managed to get majorities in some cases. But of course, we also know what happened, which is Frankfurter eventually got on the court, and the court really did have a very different sensibility. There was a, there was a very clear sense for those newer members that they had a different orientation, a different sensibility. They had been through this crucible of the Great Depression and the new administrative state, and they looked at the world differently than, you know, Van de Venter and Southern, et cetera, you know, the, the, um, the four horsemen. And again, I don't see evidence of that now. Now, one thing you might say to me is, I'm, I'm reading the wrong things, maybe. So maybe you'll tell me that there is, that there is this ferment, and I'm just, and I'm, and I'm, um, and I'm missing it. Um, but, um, you know, what can I say? I don't, um, I think that if some, if, uh, you know, Barack Obama or, um, uh, you know, somebody who was like Frankfurter, sort of a leading, uh, a leading person who was sort of a, you know, a justice in waiting, made these kinds of statements, I think they'd be kind of regarded as nutty, um, as, 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 as nutty today. Um, and so the question is, why? I mean, one possibility is, well, the Great Recession wasn't that severe. Uh, the fights over confirmation aren't that, aren't, um, aren't that great, right? It's entirely possible. It might also be, from the standpoint of the players, um, maybe we have more confidence in our system today than we did back in the Great Depression. There are a lot of reasons why we might have had less confidence more generally in the United States system in, you know, 1933 than we do when we do today. Um, there are arguments about, you know, that, that we're, we sort of feel like, well, it is what it is. You know, it's the world that, it's, it's the world that exists. There's nothing we can do. There may be more of a sense of the difficulty of, of, of turning the ship of, um, the ship of state. Um, it may also be, though, that it's now picking up a different, responding a different way to Jillian's points, that it's hard to know what you would say as a judge as to exactly how you write the opinion, um, as to why now we should have a different attitude toward these innovations than we might have, um, um, than we might have in, in the past. On what basis, so there's all the possibilities where people are gonna wanna say, oh, it's really hard to do confirmations, and ordinarily we would say, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Right, that would be the, the obvious response for a judge. You're claiming, it's all, you know, yes, it's gotten a little bit more difficult, but What's really new here? What, what could I write in an opinion that would justify me treating this differently? Maybe that's a, sort of a better way of, of, of putting it. What words could I put on paper as to why now I need to have this different attitude about these confirmation battles than my predecessors had 10, 20, 30 um, years ago? Um, and you know, part of the problem is I think if they were being honest, the words you would put on paper are words that we don't associate with judges and justices, at least as we currently conceive of them, um, which is I think that you would want to tell a story that would be in part um, a political economy story, a, a story about polarization, a story about the way that you know, politics has changed in this country because um, of self-sorting in, 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 in different states, about um, asymmetries in terms of who is hurt by uh, confirmation battles. Let me just unpack that for a second. I think that if Republicans and if conservatives and liberals felt equally hurt by the failure to, to confirm, you would expect a detente. But I think that conservative liberals do not feel equally hurt by a failure to confirm because I think that conservatives are happier with a notion of government as not functioning than liberals are. And so um, conservatives are in the end, more willing to, ha to have a period of non-confirmations. Now you might say, but wait a minute, that might leave some more liberal staffing person in charge of that agency. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to bet that if you asked if, sort of uh, um, you know, tea, tea Party leaders, what they would say is, maybe that's so, maybe there's a cost, but we're playing a long game, and our long game is, we actually like it if government is less attractive. We actually like it if um, 
if people who ordinarily would go to DC instead go to Silicon Valley or go to New York and forget about, about public service. But it's hard to write all that. <laughs> okay, now I've gotten pretty far down the wormhole. I'm not gonna write that in a judicial opinion, right? So what do I say in the judicial opinion as to why um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna treat the current world as being new and different, or at least sufficiently different that I can not just rely on the regular old tools, you know, text and history and the, and the other kinds of arguments that I'm, that I'm, accustomed, to, um, that I'm accustomed to making. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think there's ways you, you can do it disingenuously. But since I do think a lot of this really is a story of political economy, of, of, of polarization, um, since I do think those are the best arguments, I think that it leaves judges in you know, sort of an awkward, you know, an awkward position. I mean, one other thing that I think plays a role, um, and again, you can't write this in an opinion, um, is, um, is the rise of the jet airplane. It used to be that when you, were, when you served in Congress, if you were more than a couple hundred miles away, you had to move there. And there's all these stories. Koki Roberts tells stories. There's all the, every weekend it was a potluck lunch, and everybody, the kids would get together, and the families, they all knew each other. Um, and current members of Congress don't know it. They fly in Monday morning. They fly out Thursday evening. They, they literally don't know each other. Um, okay, again, you, you can't write that in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a judicial opinion. So when you get to the point of why it is we want to treat these innovations differently, I'm not quite sure what it is you say that we think looks like the kinds of things judges say. So not only would we have to have a sense of things have changed, we'd also have to have a sense of, and judges can write can write their opinion somewhat different. That, that's two tall asks. And so the easier way out is just to kind of, you know, sort of throw up our hands and say, oh, you know, those members of Congress, aren't they, aren't they amusing? And let's, and let's sort of go on with our, w with our lives, which is closer to the world that we, uh, that I think that we're currently in. And it leads to, um, to the title of a book that Jillian in her paper uh, cites by Thomas Mann and Norm Ornstein, uh, It's Even Worse Than It Looks. Um, which I think is is sadly true, and again, as I'm suggesting, I'm not sure this. I'm not sure I see a, a way for the judiciary to be helpful um, in getting us out of it. But I'm at the end of my time, so I will stop there. Thank you, Professor Benjamin. So in, a, in addition to the, the other topics of your speech, it sounds like we may need, this may be a call to arms for people to write wackier things in judicial opinions, right? So uh, maybe that is the, the solution we've been looking for. Um, at this point, we'd like to call back down all of the folks who are involved in the panel on appointment politics and Professor Levy, who will be moderate, uh, moderating it for us. Um, so we'll get, we'll get started soon. We're just a couple minutes ahead of schedule, so we um, should have ample time for questions for this panel. so much because I point out to them like nobody did it this way. You'd be regarded as kind of crazy today. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you for those uh, four very interesting presentations. So maybe I'll just throw out a couple quick questions to start the ball rolling and see if I can try to bring these strands together. So, so one question that I, I think we keep hearing, or one maybe one claim, is that uh, the the mood today is either different or maybe is not so different from how it was. Right. I think that Russ was very helpful in reminding us that when it comes to politics and appointments. You know, maybe things actually weren't all that different. Uh, I actually, it was very nice to know about what happened to President Washington. This was a surprise to me. So the question, I think, to start us off in some ways is, is what we're seeing today really a, a difference in kind or a difference in degree? And part of this is, I think, now tying into what Stuart was talking about. Are we talking about the appointments process? In particular, are we talking just more broadly about government and how functional it is? So, so I think that's one question. How different really is the mood that we're seeing today from what we saw um, say earlier in the country's history. And I think a related question then is, you know, we've been focusing in the morning on a certain kind of contestation, right? The contestation between the executive and the legislative branches, right? And to the extent that you think that what's going on today really is different, then part of what we've been hearing is a story about the various factors at play here, right? So polarization is relevant, divided government is relevant, uh, maybe technology, to Stephen's earlier point, is relevant here. So maybe there's something kind of inevitable about what we've been seeing. 
Um, but then I think this leads back into Jillian's paper, which is then does that mean that the contestation between the executive and the judiciary, are, you know, is that then going to be inevitable, right, given the way that the Roberts Court has been moving, given the various factors that Stuart was just mentioning about the ways in which judges are essentially constrained in terms of what they can write? Um, was it inevitable then from the relationship that we've been seeing between the executive branch and the legislature that we are going to have essentially the kind of the Noel Canning opinions that we'll be hearing about a little bit more later on? Part of what I would say is that when you look at the current situation, I think it is decidedly more partisan than what we're used to. But on the other hand, I think there are a lot of reasons for that. And I discussed some of these in my paper, which is, you know, you've had an effort to create certain types of districts, in which means that in Democratic districts, usually they're not subject to challenge except from the left. In Republican districts, they're not usually subject to challenge except from the right. So you've had this increasing divide between the two parties with, with very little discussion between the two. And, and then the other factor I mentioned is that, you know, with President Obama, you know, his decision that he's going to take unilateral action on a number of different things has really created almost a war climate where I think we're going to see an increasingly contentious situation, and I don't know how we get out of it. Um, uh, I think actually uh, Bill earlier today talked about the four spikes of polarization. Um, uh, uh, and so if you, if you plot this on historical perspective, there certainly have been other times of dramatic polarization. Um, it is true that if you go back over the last 50 years, and, and for me, the, the relevant issues here are because I do see this as being, how does it interact with the administrative state? Um, so since we've had the modern administrative state, have, have we had similar degrees of polarization since Landis and Frankfurter succeeded? Um, uh, and I think there the answer is it is more different. Um, there are a lot of very uh, interesting political science accounts of how the Voting Rights Act uh, fit into this, um, debates about the extent to which districting plays a role or, or not. Um, I, I, but um, there does seem to be um, an intensification of polarization with um, the parties you know, not having much overlap on issues, much less reason to compromise, um, much uh, more disagreement um, uh, between them in ways that, that affects um, the extent to which uh, d particularly divided government has an impact if you don't have that much polarization or if you've got a Democratic Party that has Southern Democrats um, in it and you've got a Republican Party that has Northern Republicans in it. Um, uh, uh, you, you may not need, um, divided government may not make the big difference um, in terms of the ability to, to undertake major action that it, that it can today. Um, the, the difference in focusing on the administrative state is that, of course, the baseline then has changed because of the ability for there to be executive action. Um, uh, and um, uh, you know, the extent to which that then has a feedback effect on Congress may very well turn on the, what the courts do, right? Um, there is much more turn to the courts um, by Republicans to try and counter Obama um, than I think we have seen in prior years, in part because it's hard to Harder to work out the political solutions, perhaps. Um, uh, so in that sense, you could say, well, then the judicial uh, uh, and executive and legislative seem inevitable. Um, I'm not convinced that they are. Um, I think that actually one of the things that we are seeing is, to be frank, a much more conservative Supreme Court. Um, uh, and um, we the extent to which the courts are more willing to step into areas of political contestation to see their role as really being to police a particular um, arrangement, an arrangement that they see as, as required by separation of powers, I think has also changed over time. Um, I think what we had in the aftermath, and, and this was in part um, the, the result of the New Deal and the popular consciousness that came from it, um, but we ha uh, when you had the baseline acceptance of the, the administrative state, um, there was less willingness for a while in the parts of courts. They would still intervene in terms of judicial review, sometimes quite dramatically. Um, but there wasn't, I think, the, the degree to which we have a court right now that really sees its role as being to very strongly be the constitutional policer 
um, and to read what the Constitution requires in, I think, a, a little bit too formalistic and rigid a way. Um, that said, I actually th think that the, the bottom line result um, on Noel Canning may very well have been right, um, uh, it, that the, the text uh, of the Constitution doesn't allow you to come to a different result. But going back to something Stewart said, I mean, one of the things that I find surprising in the Supreme Court's decisions um, is that there isn't even, I think it is possible in Noel Canning, particularly when we have so much discussion of historical practice, to talk about why we suddenly have this issue coming with pro forma sessions and with recess appointments. Um, I don't think Breyer is particularly opposed to acknowledging um, the reality, and yet it's not there. And that I, that I find quite interesting. Um, uh, and I do think that there are ways in, in, in fairly traditional judicial terms for the court to do that acknowledgment. And remedial doctrine, I think, is one of them. So we do have doctrines where the courts over time have limited the impact of their decisions in very you know, judicial-esque ways um, that they don't seem inclined to do. Um, and so I think there are still some traditional openings there. Um, uh, but you're right, certainly sort of uh, open engagement with the political climate may not seem the kind of thing that we would expect the courts to be doing. But part of my question is maybe if they're going to be playing that role, we should. If I can just, just pick up what, um, I just think Julie, Julie made a really important point that I want to expand on very slightly. Um, so we had a period in, uh, in the, uh, economically from the, the 40s to the 70s that we now think of as being the Great Compression, where actually the Gini coefficient went down, inequality went down. And then inequality went up, and, and there was, it, it was against our, sort of our, our background norms. Was, as Bill Galson points out, there have been other points of polarization. But in the, in the working lives of almost everybody alive, um, there was this, um, there, there was much less polarization, especially because for the older people who were alive, it used to be that um, if you did the, you know, the pool scores of, of, of members of the House and Senate, you had three groups. You had, you had Southern Democrats, Northern Democrats, and Republicans, and you had to get two of those three to agree to any significant legislation. They had different bedfellows that were being made. We now have much more, um, much more coherent political parties. Um, and so I don't, and I actually don't know what's going to We'll change that. So then, back to the question, both about what's new and you know, kind of, and how and 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 how um, we should respond. I mean, I think I think part of what is new and kind of, you know, sort of remarkable to me is, you know, my I wasn't around them. My, my my sense is that if you went to Everett Dirksen in the 1960s and you said, look, this is really what we we actually need this agency to function. You and you want this agency to function too, don't you? He'd say, yeah, I do. Actually, there's a lot of um, members of the House and Senate who say, no, it's actually fine with me if this agency uh, doesn't function. Um, really and truly, I will actually pay no cost. I'm, I'm in more danger of being primaried than I'm of losing the general. So there's, there is no benefit to me to tacking one inch toward the, toward the middle. That feels new, I mean, again, new in, 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 my, you know, in my political lifetime. Um, and feels new and different to me, even though I recognize that, you know, if I, if I were 200 years old, I'd say, oh, yeah, but boy, 1860, 1800, those were brutal. Yeah, I, right, but we don't have that perspective. And I would just throw out that I think, piggybacking on what everyone else said and trying not to be redundant, um, that in every age there's complexity and uncertainty revolving around the separation of powers. And this is just a new age, and it feels, because we're living it, it feels like it's worse and different than anything else. So I don't think that's necessarily true. Uh, but I do think when you're dealing with power, it raises for me uh, Roberto Unger's idea of uh, the principle of arbitrary desire. You can dress people up. You can look reasonable. But deep down, we're motivated by sex, greed, and power. Not in that order. And just look at TV, and you'll see all three of those are promoted really highly. Um, and so in this age, when you're dealing with a power that's not set, clearly, and it has vague contours in particular, you're going to get these kinds of conflicts. And the other thing I'd point out is, is it worse today? It's more visible today. And that's because of the technology. It's on Twitter. Everyone has their cell phone camera. You cannot think that whatever you're doing, and even politicians now, it's not behind closed doors. So we may want political policy and sausage, but we are going to see it being made these days. And in judicial opinions, they may have to do things a little differently to explain how, the new, how they're going to adapt to what is going on in the real world. Thank you. Well, let's open it up to Q&A. So Jillian. Oh, sorry, Nina. 
<laughs> I actually just had I had a question actually for Jillian, um, and I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what it would look like to have more tolerant judicial review for innovation. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned remedial doctrines uh, that courts could invoke, um, but I wonder if you would be willing to go as far as actually uh, defending a regime where courts give just a lot of space. Mm -hmm. And here I'm thinking about uh, the political safeguards approach under the mm -hmm. Tenth Amendment and whether that you think would be more desirable than what we have, and if not, why not? <coughs> um, I actually do. I mean, so I think um, uh, I think there are a lot of different gradations that it'd be worth it to pay attention to. So one is, um, in some sense, I find the rejection of innovation in Sibelius more troubling than the uh, than uh, rejection of, of uh, innovation in Noel Canning. Um, on the thought that um, in what, what you have in play in Sibelius is a measure that did, in fact, pass Congress and was signed into law by the president. And the fact that it is a regulatory uh, arrangement that is new and we've never done before, I don't see any reason that that should therefore be reason to treat it as suspicious. So I think there's that's one way, and that's a little bit of way of saying, uh, and that, of course, does have the sort of enumerated powers federalism aspect to it, right? Um, but I would also say in separation of powers that um, uh, there is, um, I think there's probably one thing the court should do is give a little bit more room um, and not be as, as inclined to think that the separation of powers are as clear and firm um, as I think they think they are. Um, uh, again, part of what's at stake there, I think, are different separation of powers visions. And I think uh, we have, th these decisions have been very, you know, five to four decisions are very contentious. Um, I think what we're seeing playing out is a very particular vision of the separation of powers, and one should maybe be careful about going from that to some broader conclusion about the courts writ large. Um, but I do think that they are reading the separation of powers um, too narrowly uh, and not leaving more space uh, that, that I think could be there. That said, it may be the case that Noel Canning is actually one, even if you're giving more space, it's just textually very hard to justify. Yes, in the back. Off of what you just said, and, and well, actually, what all panels said, um, it seems getting back to the appointment power itself, as opposed to the substantive outcomes of the government. To a certain extent, I hear people in different ways, sort of wrestling with the difference between asking courts to do something affirmatively and courts getting out of the way. I mean, I you can view the New Deal and and Frankfurter. I mean, the whole dilemma of Frankfurter's career is the difference between getting out of the way and wanting courts to do something affirmatively. So if you look at the Peekaboo case, the court hinted at questioning the administrative state, but the case itself is kind of a nothing burger. If you look at the Consumer uh, Protection Board, um, yes, my friend Rich Cordray couldn't get, a, get uh, affirmed for a very long time, and Elizabeth Warren couldn't get affirmed, although how did that work out for the people who opposed her? Um, <laughs> but the board itself exists. Um, so I guess the, my question is that if the Constitution really leaves, if it didn't even recognize agencies, then why would we expect it to guarantee the efficacy of the kind of actions that, that, that are being alluded to. In other words, within the appointment power, it seems that the Constitution gives a very, very wide berth to the separation of powers, to the, to the tussle between the branches, and we're just either fortunate or unfortunate to be on the winning or losing end of currently which way those politics cut. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're. I mean, I think you're absolutely right in pointing out uh, one of the real. Um, I mean, in that sense, free enterprise is a very striking decision, right? Because of what it it it, it seems to say in broad strokes, and then absolutely refuses to do in practice. Both, in essence, sanctioning by its remedy the legitimacy of in, of independent um, agencies with one level of forecast, um, and in taking this move of just severing. I mean, the whole, the whole reason behind the lawsuit was actually to force the thing to be invalidated, to force it back in, and to get more exemptions and to, to do the, the craft it in a different way. Um, and so the challengers did not get um, at all what they, what they wanted there. Um, I, and I think 
I think you're right. There is a, a little bit what I am calling for is uh, you know, staying out of the way um, and letting, leaving room for some political branch experimentation um, that I worry the court, if it takes too aggressive a separation of powers enforcement, may not be willing to do. Um, underlying that is, of course, my view that actually the separation of powers, the constitutional basis, allows um, uh, and, and for what the, for the political branches to set a lot of the, the detail here. Um, uh, and so that that's also a constitutionally legitimate approach for the courts, for the courts to take. Um, uh, but I do think free enterprise is interesting in that if the courts do find it necessary to intervene, um, the uh, intervening in a way that has more limited impact um, uh, in terms of disrupting uh, political arrangements also has tremendous appeal. Um, and in some sense, not letting litigation achieve a victory that wasn't coming politically by just severing a, a, a measure can do that. Um, it still changes the balance and compromises, right? So it's not like you can say it's innocuous. But the remedial aspect of free enterprise, in some sense, I think, um, uh, allows that decision to become the nothing burger um, than it otherwise, otherwise could be. Sort of interested in your thoughts about the DC Circuit's opinion in intercollegiate broadcasting. So this is a case with a copyright royalty board judges um, who set royalty prices for kind of digital downloads of music, um, and they're sitting within the Library of Congress, right? The Librarian of Congress chose them, and according to the statute, they were supposed to be protected from removal except for cause, and the DC Circuit is more open to the innovation and linking to the remedies says, okay, we're gonna get rid of this removal restriction, but we're gonna call the Library of Congress, the Librarian of Congress, the head of an executive department. Um, and, um, most political scientists would say the Library of Congress is not executive. Um, and so I'm just curious, sort of what you think about that case and maybe also in line with the case that the Supreme Court just heard oral arguments in in December about the Amtrak case, where you have sort of innovations in agency structures in terms of quasi-agencies and what the role of the court and New Deal doctrine in the Amtrak case might play. Um, yeah, I mean, so uh, I think my concern about the Amtrak case is that the court will continue to be sort of resistant to what in that case I think isn't particularly innovative. I think we have so many of these structures as you've written about, right? Um, uh, and the idea that we would um, re revitalize a non-delegation challenge or a kind of structural in it aspect of it um, in that regard it strikes me as pretty alarming. Even a due process angle there has tr tremendous uh, potential to be really disruptive of a lot of regulatory regimes. Um, uh, in, and in ways that I don't think make sense um, without sort of really fleshing out why exactly we think it's due process. Is it a government, if a government agency is sort of making a decision and something that affects its own powers is, is a violation of due process, then there are a whole lot of administrative schemes that suddenly raise some pretty serious due process issues. So um, uh, I, I think there's a, a lot of potential for that decision, depending on how the court goes, to be quite destabilizing. Um, uh, and it may be very in, uh, interesting and a sign of exactly how far the Roberts Court is willing to, to, to go in policing uh, some bounds here about whether or not it, it would actually do that. Um, the, uh, the copyright board I find interesting. Um, I, it, is, it is a case, I mean, so again, it's like um, the acknowledging of reality versus formalism, right? So because the Librarian of Congress is appointed uh, by the President with Senate confirmation, it fits the traditional executive model, but as you say, any political science, anybody looking at it in reality would say, excuse me, that would be the Library of Congress. This is not what we usually think of as an executive agency. Um, uh, and you know, I think my call for a little more, bit more engagement with reality might suggest that's not, you shouldn't call it an executive agency. On the other hand, you should be a little bit realistic about how much this uh, status of these judges to have four cause removal protection is really transforming them into principal officers in a way that really upsets the constitutional scheme either. Um, uh, and um, uh, so it, it, I think it would, it might, you might end up at the same place, but with a more engaging with the underlying realities um, of what this entity is and what it was doing um, in the process. Great. Other questions? Sure. I had a question. Um, 
So one of the solutions or uh, potential innovations that was mentioned a few times during our first session um, was the possibility of reducing the total number of positions that are actually subject to confirmation. And it seemed like uh, a lot of people from the first session were definitely on board with that. Um, I guess my question, uh, and this is directed towards the entire panel, is what do you think would be the effects from that um, on the sort of uh, political polarization angle um, of reducing the total number of appointments and whether in the modern day and age, now that we have Twitter, now that we have Facebook, now that we have 24-7 news coverage, would that actually exacerbate the problem um, to have uh, a reduction in the number of key uh, appointments that are actually going to be televised and fought over, or do you think uh, people would care less just simply because fewer people are being confirmed? That's a great. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a great question. I mean, you know, if, part of the problem is there's so many now that if we cut up another couple hundred, nobody would be aware of it. But let's no, but let's imagine we get we we're, we're more radical, right? We're going to say we're going to confirm, you know, the, the the secretary, you know, the heads of these various departments and really not much many other people. Now there's a huge focus on 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 who those people are. You know, every bit of attention is 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 trained that way. I still feel like the system is so horrible now. I'm still willing to I'm willing to go with that with that with that innovation, but uh, you know, I mean, I I guess one way of sort of reframing your question is it, some of the contestation is very powerful groups who have a huge amount of interest, right now they can say, all right, well, look, I'm not going to be able to get the person, I'm not going to be able to do anything about the person who's going to be the Secretary of Treasury, but I can really go after that person who was going to be the Deputy Undersecretary for Undersecretary Affairs. And now if that person isn't confirmed anymore, then maybe I need to sort of train more of my firepower higher up. Anybody else on the panel? I mean, I agree. It's a, I think it's a really interesting I think it's a really interesting question. I think it is one of the um, innovations. Uh, I mean, the problem is, is how do you get to that point, right? Because um, from, from all the discussion we've had today, it seems like there are reasons for both members of Congress uh, in particular and the, and the Senate um, you know, not passing the legislation that would pull back the requirement of, uh, of confirmation. Um, I, but it does seem like it's one of the reforms that um, that could have that could have a significant difference. I mean, in thinking about that aspect of our system judicially, um, one of the things that might make sense to think about, and again, this would differentiate Noel Canning, um, is how should the court treat um, exec novel executive actions involving appointments of inferior officers compared to principal officers, right? Um, uh, and if, in fact, what I mean. If, if, the, if a governing statute requires confirmation, then, then it's, you know, it's, it's violating the governing statute no matter what. Um, um, on the other hand, uh, it is, I think, more troubling when you have the executive branch taking an action that is violating the governing statute or maybe pushing the edges um, of, uh, you know, acting appointment and so forth um, with respect to a principal officer than with respect to an inferior officer, given that the Constitution itself is more willing to accept a different kind of so if, if the actual appointment process sort of fit with a form of in, inferior officer appointment, um, uh, that at least might lead us to be maybe a little bit less troubled by pushing the envelope in some of those cases. Um, but on the other hand, maybe courts should be really rigid where it's a principal officer. That said, I mean, the if, it, if it's at odds with the statute, um, you could see a court again trying to take this out into effect in terms of remedy rather than in terms of acknowledging or saying there wasn't a legal violation at all. Well, you know, part of it depends upon not to, I got to keep my contrarian role here. Um, part of it depends on what you're valuing and what you're interested in. I mean, if you're less interested in democratic accountability and governmental transparency, having fewer confirmations would be desirable. On the other hand, if you're more concerned about governmental accountability, and letting the political processes um, come to bear on this, then I think you would want not want to shrink it too much. Um, you know, and, and, and that brings us back to one of the things that came up this morning, which is they said, well, look, you have to fill out all these forms and you have to, to disclose all your financial affairs. Well, you can look at that two ways. You can say it's a burden. On the other hand, you can say, we know a lot more about these people. And I will say, 
I'm not, I'm not trying to get completely off track, but we've got a real problem in this country with governmental accountability and transparency at the moment. Let me just look at the Snowden situation. It's absolutely extraordinary that the government's collecting vast amounts of information, and, and you know, if it hadn't been for Snowden, we wouldn't even know about it. So I think we have to keep the competing values in mind. Stephen, did you want to jump in? Sorry. No? Other questions? Matt. For Gillian, I mean, I, just, I want to, um, and you know for Enterprise Fund a lot better than I do, but there's a different sort of reading of it that one might have. I mean, so my reaction, a possible reaction to the case, is sort of like my reaction to the Lopez case in the Commerce Clause, right? Lopez, you know, is the first case since 37 where the court strikes down a statute as beyond the Commerce Clause, right? Uh, but it doesn't fundamentally change posting of the old doctrine, right? So Lopez says, you know, we're not going to go back to the old direct effect test. We accept substantial effect. We accept all the cases, right, from Darby and Wickard all the way up to the civil rights cases. Um, uh, uh, it's just that uh, there's a limit, right? We're not going to uphold this sort of extraordinary law regulating this non-commercial activity, gun possession near schools. I mean, there's a similar possible reading of free enterprise fund, namely that there's a lot of sort of innovations uh, uh, in terms of uh, post New Deal uh, um, administrative law, sort of crystallized in Morrison that Free Enterprise Fund doesn't uh, reject. So the Morrison test, the fuzzy sort of, you know, impede the president's ability test, is not, is not affirmed in Free Enterprise Fund, but it's not rejected. Right? The court, to my mind, sort of signals that in general, independent agencies are fine. What's problematic is, is this dual for cause limitation. Uh, it doesn't uh, um, uh, seriously call into question the status of administrative law judges or civil servants in independent agencies. Uh, it actually tolerates innovation in terms of recognizing the SEC as a department and as the SEC, you know, uh, a commissioner and as a collectivity as a head. Uh, it just says, you know, there's a limit. And we reserve the power to say that in some other case there's going to be a limit as well, right? But it's sort of, um, you know, and again, so in a way it's hard to... The right reading of it will depend on what half, what comes of it, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, but again, another reading that the court is saying this is not going to be an area where we're completely going to be deferential to Congress. Um, uh, there are certain arrangements we're going to strike down, but the basic sort of, you know, apparatus of post review administrative law, the kind of thing that unitary executive type hate, we're not calling that into question. I mean, look. I think you're. I think you're right. I actually agree with the. It was nothing burger, right? That was the. That was the phrase. I actually think that's right. Um, uh, you know, as an aside, I think it's a remarkable um, and somewhat troubling form of legal analysis to basically, by ipsy dixit, ensure that the opinion has absolutely no impact that its words and holding might otherwise suggest. So, the carving out of the ALJs, the carving out of the military, the carving out of all of the civil service, um, and a lot of the potentially troubling uh, effects of a prohibition on double four cause are limited by the fact that the court says, we are not saying anything about those. The, the logic why, given its reasoning, you wouldn't be saying something about those remains to me quite unclear. Um, and as you say, I do read, actually, free enterprise as essentially affirming the constitutionality of independent agencies, um, because its remedy, at the end of the day, was to create an administrative agency that had a single level of four-cause removal and uphold it as addressing the constitutional harm. Um, in some sense, I think the most troubling aspect at the end of the day of free enterprise is its suggestion that innovation um, is something to be suspect about, and that is language in the opinion that has then been taken on. Um, and you see the court raising it in Sibelius, and you see the, the, it, it getting a lot more traction. Um, uh, and I am troubled if innovation per se is seen as a reason for constitutional skepticism. So I agree with you about free enterprise itself. I think the court was very careful to read it that way. And it may very well be that what we see in free enterprise is that, in general, on these matters, it will just be the shot across the bow. There is some limit. And we're almost never going to say you reach it. Um, but insofar as it becomes, as the court then seems to suggest, and, and you see it then again in terms of Shelby with the rejection of the novelty of the Voting Rights Act, a move uh, that the court is willing to launch onto and then be able to cite itself for this idea that innovative measures are itself are themselves ground for judicial skepticism. I think that's troubling. Final questions from the group. Yes. Please. This question was suggested by what Jillian asked, but I'm curious what the other panel is, how their, their reaction. You talked about being more realistic, about the courts being more realistic. 
if we look at the courts as they look at legislative process, you could argue that recently the Supreme Court has been more realistic. In Shelby, they looked behind the idea of deferring to the legislature and said, because this was passed unanimously, it can't really mean anything. Mm -hmm. um, in Enfib versus Sebelius, obviously, the dissenters refer to the various political compromises. I'm curious, from a constitutional point of view, what the panelists think about whether it is correct or incorrect for the Supreme Court to think about the realities of legislation and the legislative process as opposed to taking it at a more either superficial or formalistic level, depending on your predilection here. I'm curious how that would fit in because the, the people at both ends of the panel here both referred to constitutional, the constitutional framework, and I'm curious what their reaction is to whether the court should be looking behind legislation, which could then obviously have impact on how they might deal with appointment and other issues that are germane to today's symposium. Oh, sure. Um, so I think it's a great I think it's a great question, and um, I mean first just note others have um, made this point, but it's um, that we have uh, we have a Supreme Court filled with people with executive branch experience, and um, only Steve Breyer served for a couple of years as counsel um, uh, before he became before he became a judge to, to to Ted Kennedy, and that's about the sum total I think. I try to remember anybody else spent any significant time on the Hill other than Breyer. And of course, he's the one who's most likely to bring in sort of the, the political realities. And there, there's an article by um, um, uh, Abby, uh, uh, um, Abby Gluck uh, just interviewing a whole, uh, um, a whole bunch of people who actually write the uh, legislation and asking them about what canons they, they, they pay attention to. Um, and it turns out that they're not paying anything like any attention at all to the canons that j judges think they should be, th think they should be and are paying attention to. So there's all sorts of good reasons to, 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 to think that, um, uh, that members of the court really truly don't understand the, the, le the legislative process and might, and might benefit from a greater uh, uh, understanding of it. I think it's probably right, and I think it's probably, and, and so, I, so I personally would be happy to see more injections of that kind of understanding. Here's the, sort of, here's the asterisk. Um, this is sort of like the point that it, um, we've all read different justices recount history in Supreme Court opinions. And I think that we all have a sense that we think some of that history was really quite motivated. The person was just picking the, the you know the old joke about legislative history, you're going to a party, picking out your friends, that they're going to the history, they're picking out their friends, and that some of them are trying to do a more careful, a more careful job of it. And so, of course, my fear would be that, in fact, you would be doing this sort of, you know, instance, I, all I care about is, is reaching a certain result, so I'm just going to find whatever stories I can from the legislative process that, you know, that, um, that produced that. But that's always a danger. I mean, so back to your original question, yeah, I would, I would prefer a greater sense, a, a greater sensitivity to um, all sorts of um, legislative realities that, um, you know, sort of that they must, that they must know and that, and that, you know, trip them up um, all the time. Just in this regard, one quick anecdote. Um, Abner Mikva tells a great story of um, when he was first a, a, a young congressman, um, he um, was proposing. Um, he, he was he was supporting RICO, and um, and he was concerned. Actually, he was anyway, he was concerned that RICO was going to be interpreted too broadly. I sorry, sorry, he didn't he didn't like it. And he he, said, he went to the to, to the sponsor, um, and he raised his concerns. And then he just went on the on the floor and said, if RICO is passed, it's going to have this incredibly broad. And that got cited over and over again. He said, if he had been smarter, he would have gone to the sponsor, and they would have had a, a, a fake colloquy. I mean, a, a colloquy. You, the sponsor, you don't really think RICO applies this broadly. And he would have said, no, no, it doesn't apply that broadly. That's not what I intend. And Mikva was kicking himself because he, he didn't use the legislative me mechanism the way that he, that he should have. That's, I, that story I just told you, I, it's totally opaque to any, to any justice, right? This is not, again, with the possible exception of, uh, of Breyer. And you know, that, that level of knowledge, you know, I, I sort of feel like, yeah, I think on net net, it's got to help. Um. I have mixed reactions to this. I can see the benefits of it. But on the other hand, I think there's a real risk here. And, you know, for example, there was an article last year which did an empirical study of 
what congressional staffers thought about the meaning of legislation. And as I think about that, you know, what I say is, well, you know, it reminds me of, there's a, there was a Canadian clip some years ago, which was essentially, you know, if the legislative history's unclear, it's okay to actually read the statute. And, and, and you know, and I, I'm thinking, you mean we're going to give a lot of weight to what staffers think? I mean, granted, they may have a lot of involvement in the process, but don't we start with the text? Don't we start with committee reports? You know, there are a lot of things you want to look at. It strikes me that what staffers are saying would be way down the list, and I guess I fear where all this goes. Well, with Steve, did you want to jump in? I, I would just agree with that. Um, Churchill uh, once said, history will be kind to me because I intend to write it. And um, basically, if we have one justice who says, I know the legislative process, I'm going to write these cases based on my own experience, it could be pulled in different directions. Great. Thank you. Well, thanks to our panelists. Thanks to all of you. I think that wraps up the second session. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. I'll see you in Paris, I guess. Did you, and you got your hotel? I'll be curious. I'll be really, really. We're still working on that, but the tickets are done. Um, the release doesn't have a. Thanks to all of our participants in session two. We're going to take a 10-minute break until 3.05, and then we'll return for our third and final panel on the recess appointments clause. Thank you, everyone.